and all that crap with the whole of the law. And for Extreme Metal fans, this was a date on the calendar that had to be circled. It was a highlight of the fourth quarter early on. It was something that needed to be experienced. And here we are, the experiences here. It's almost like deja freaking vu, considering three years ago, Desideratum the dropped, ironically, on the same day. That's what happens whenever release dates go from Tuesdays to Fridays. Sometimes the calendar works in your favor. It's weird. So this is a band that, with Death and Theaterdom, released a fantastic album. It was one that performed very highly on the list for 2013, and many people felt the same way, except for those who think a little bit too much and think that the electronic signatures are a bad part of Anona Kratz's sound, and that they are using some signatures that are resembling breakdowns within their music, and that's causing it to be shit. Their best stuff was behind them. Their best stuff is all the way back whenever they were that demo band back in like the early 2000s or 1990s, whatever the hell it was. It is not good anymore. Some people think way too much and need to cool it because that's the dinner that was really good. Now, for those of you who this is the first time this name has jutted out on the screen to you, you need to experience this band to understand what they are all about. So this is chaos that is not easily really given a genre tag. There's no such thing as chaos metal, although maybe there should be. It seems like it'd be right in heavy metal's wheelhouse, but that's really one of the best ways to describe this, or insanity. You know, this is insanity. It's controlled to a certain degree, in other locations it is left to really just roam unabated and sonically not really necessarily pioneer all of that much, but just instead explore the depths of absolute chaos. And that's what these guys have done now for 15 years, roughly. Nine albums, this is number nine. And you can hear that whenever you get from the Nameless Dread right into Depravity play, uh, Favors the Bold, really just to start it right off. You start to hear some of these tortured screams, these disembodied sounding cries, and lyricism, if you want to look this up to hear what the hell he's saying, good fucking luck. They are not published. These are not published lyrics. So you are going to have to be left to your own devices, imagination, and patience in order to try to determine anything about this. But the thing that's a, that sort of makes it interesting is that this chaos and this cacophony of real tortured vocals that just have screams and just growls just sort of plastered all over the place behind this backdrop that has a little bit of electronic resonance. They do use, you know, synths and other programming to their advantage. The drumming is programmed and is insane. The bass and the guitar just sort of cascade and waft. This is a two-member project, so you need to understand they are doing the best with what they've got. But throughout all of this, what you're noticing is that even though it sounds like essentially the thought that you would have prior to being murdered, it is also kind of somehow organized. It's something that does stay together enough for you to enjoy it. Somehow, this band has found a way to collect essentially insanity within a jar and then study it carefully and organize it in a way that it could be presented without being absolutely overwhelming. Although to first time listeners, it certainly can feel that way. Once you become a seasoned vet, that's not really a problem. Depravity favors the bold, really good first track, but it does not hold a candle to hold your children uh, close and pray for oblivion. First of all, it's an epic song title, but second of all, holy shit, what a beast of a track this is. This is definitely one of the early highlights. And what's interesting about that is that the follow-ups, We Will Fucking Kill You, and then going into So We Can Die Happy, this is starting to read like a book. It was really starting to read like a couple of sentences within a book. So, let's take a look at this. <coughs> we'll use a book as a prop because I'm a fucking loser. The Nameless Dread. Depravity favors the bold. Hold your children close and pray for oblivion. We will fucking kill you so we can die happy. And then it kind of gets the momentum killed by it. You know, does that go? <laughs> it kind of a little bit. But then it goes right into Annual Beg for Our Secrets. And the one thing that I can say is I can mention all of these song titles and I don't have to say much about the music itself because it does stay within that register of absolute insanity. And that's why I say this is a band that needs to be experienced rather than, you know, forcefully described to you. It's almost like I'm giving away those secrets, you know. It's like you're going to beg me for the secrets of their secrets. I don't know their secrets. I'm begging them for their secrets. I don't know what causes this band to sound as as good as it does, even though it just feels like chaos has been unleashed. I know I'm saying that a lot, but it's just the truth. That's just the reality of it. 
this is a wall of sound that sort of washes you whenever you're taking this in. And whenever Dave Hunt's or Vitriol's uh, vocals are just, you know, whenever he's going insane, whenever he's yelling and screaming, there are some that are extremely high-pitched registered. Some of them scale upward with real power and passion and really just add to the overall delusion of insanity. And it's, it's something that just adds so much to this. It has this sort of calculated register of the human mind collapsing in on itself. And somehow, some way, it is really, really attractive to a lot of people, myself included. I really enjoy how they're able to do this. It's really intoxicating. It's hard to put down and it's hard to stop listening to this. What's interesting though is that their final three songs really captivate uh, within uh, just looking at them considering it's the longest section of the album. On Being a Slave, which does have some things that could trigger the week in it, although not very much. I think people would just, you know, dig and dive and find some trigger warning within any of these tracks because people are fucking idiots these days. Going into The Great Spectator and then Of Horror and The Black Shawls. Five and a half minutes, three, nearly four minutes, and then nearly six minutes. This represents the longest period on the album, and this also represents sort of a collective amalgamation of what... I don't know crap really bring to the table. The real question is, do I enjoy this more than I enjoy Desiderium, which did very, very well in 2013 for Album of the Year? And the answer to that question is not quite as much. I really like that album a lot. It just sort of hit me at the right time, hit me in the right spot, and it's been an album I've revisited many times ever since. I like a lot of their elder discography as well, do not get me wrong. Uh, but uh, that was an album that just really seemed to showcase a, a band that was sort of pushing forward and, and doing so at a very high level. This is an album that feels not so much like a step back, but almost like they were aiming to compete with that disc, either that or aiming to sort of uh, be on the same level as it. It just fell a little bit short. Uh, it's a strong disc. It's one that's not going to be for everybody. It's insanity unbridled, as I keep mentioning. But what's kind of cool about this which is an 86 out of 100, by the way. It's a it's a really solid disc. I liked it a lot. Uh, but it does come with a couple of covers. Uh, there's a specials cover, Man at CNA. But the one that's going to attract so much attention, and already has a little bit, has been the Power Slave cover, the Iron Maiden cover. Um, and this is one that definitely will have a lot of elder fans, you know, traditional fans, fans that are not into extreme metal, scratching their heads and wondering why this is considered good by some people. But then whenever you dig into it, it is something that is pretty well tailored. It's it's what would have happened if Bruce Dickinson was replaced by a man that has paranoid schizophrenia and is a musician and also, also is contemplating actually slaying the Pharaoh. That's the best way that I can describe it. And somehow, some way, in ancient Egypt, they had instruments that were capable, and recording equipment that was capable, and formats of recording that recorded material capable of handling the sound that you get from this cover. It's savage. Um, I kind of like it. It's one of those sort of half and half things. I can see where it has a lot of trademarks of the original, and they put their own spin on it, which is not going to appease everybody. But I kind of dig it. It, it was hard for me to put that song down. It really was. The solo is, it represents something that this band is not really known very well for because it's a very clean solo. Uh, it's something where you can hear each of the individual notes. Uh, that's not something that's within this band's wheelhouse, uh, but it is something that they pulled off. So there you go. I want to know what you guys think about the whole of the law. Tell me what you know about the whole of the law in the comments below uh, by I know I'm not crap. That was a sentence where the clauses were in five different places and none of them will write. So I'm going to shut up now because I'm Cover Killer Nation and I'll talk to you next time whenever my brain is better arranged. Take care. Thanks again for checking out this album review. If you want to see more of the reviews for albums released in 2016, check out the playlist to your left. If you want to know five reasons why some bands are hated, why would people do this, check out the playlist to your right. You can also subscribe to my channel and scope out my Patreon. Thanks again for viewing and we'll see you next time. Take care.